This presentation is titled, What's That Bone? Historic Butchery Techniques in San Diego. Hello everyone, my name is Blake Tragosis. Pictured there on the right, I'm a student at Palomar College in Cal State Fullerton, currently going for my bachelor's in anthropology, heading into archaeology. I have interned at the San Diego Natural History Museum for three years, and working in the zoo archaeology lab there, introduced me into my interest into archaeology, specifically faunal analysis and the interactions between humans and their natural environment. With this presentation, I hope to introduce you into the basics of historical butchery techniques and ways that you can identify butchered bones that you come across, as well as explain some of the many stories that bones can tell. So what is butchery? Butchery is quite simply the act of cutting up and preparing an animal for consumption, and has been a part of humanity since the beginning. Butchery has been a part of humanity for as long as we have hunted. However, as times and technology change, so do the techniques used in butchery. Historically, in San Diego, the most common animals butchered were cattle, pigs, chicken, and sheep. Here on the top left, we can see a diagram of the most popular cuts of meat on a cow. And on the bottom right, we can see what the skeleton looks like underneath. Some of the examples of bones you could find associated with cattle cuts would be scapula and humerus bones found in chuck cuts and sacral vertebrae in sirloin cuts. Next, we can see a diagram of a pig with examples of bones being associated such as bones of the feet being associated with hawk cuts, as well as it being not uncommon to include the entire pig skull in a classic feast presentation. Next, we see a diagram of a chicken and some of the more obvious bones associated would be the tibias on drumsticks, or radius and ulna in the wings, but also commonly found are the wishbone, aka the clavicle, and the whole ribs and pelvis on a typically butchered whole chicken. Next, we see a diagram of a lamb or a sheep, which can once again be identified by a number of bones, typically the long bones for leg cuts, ribs, or lumbar vertebrae associated with loins and sirloins. Next, we'll get comfortable with identifying some of the types of marks and butchery that leave, can be left on bones. Cut marks are some of the most common marks left on bones and can often indicate butchery. Cleave marks are similar to cut marks except that they are typically deeper cuts and show a different pattern as the force dissipates in the bone, quite literally cleaving the bone in half. Cleave marks do not just have to be made by cleavers though, and they can be made by other instruments such as hatchets and butchering knives. Saw marks are something we expect to see a lot of in historic butchery, especially bones that have come from restaurants or professional butchery shops. They are best shown by the striations or lines running through the cut and are clean but can be seen through these striations which are caused by the stopping and starting action of the saw. Bones were sawn by hand until 1923, when Edmund Michael invented the electric saw, which greatly sped up the process and resulted in easier, cleaner cuts, which made smaller striations. Burn marks can also be evidence of cooking left on bones. However, it is important to think logically about which part of the bones are burnt, as if a bone is blackened, the person who cooked it either was a really bad cook or was thrown into the fire for cook and not used for cooking, but was instead just disposed. Percussion blows are also common marks found on bones, and in some circumstances, this can indicate the breaking of bones for bone marrow extraction. Here I included a modern example of a spiral cut ham to showcase another way that butchery marks can appear on bone. Chronology can be hard to pin down, especially in the historical period. However, there are some ways to go about this. To get an age on how old the bone is itself, the most common practice is to understand the context it is associated with, such as associated artifacts and provenience, which provides the easiest way to date bones with evidence of butchery. Of course, if you wanted to get precise dates, you could always carbonate the bone, but this is expensive and is generally not justified on historic faunal material. Here on the right, we can see a photo depicting an excavation of Thomas Jefferson's Monticello home. This again shows that context is key, as often what we, the artifacts we find in kitchens can both say that it is a kitchen and also can point to what type of meats and foods were being eaten at the place. In San Diego, the beginning of a butchery 
as we see in the historical period, begins with the arrival of the Spanish in 1769. When the first missions were established, they brought with them cattle, sheep, and chicken to promote self-sufficiency among the missions. With the introduction of these animals to San Diego, the cuisine was radically changed, and ranching became a huge business in San Diego for almost a hundred years. Here on the right, we see a study conducted by Aaron Sasson and Susan Arder on the use of chickens at the San Diego Presidio, which was the first European settlement in North America. This study concluded that chickens were not just used as food, but were important safety nets for the women who lived and worked at the Presidio, trading and selling their eggs as ch and chickens as capital. Butchery was an important but largely unnoticed aspect of daily life in historic San Diego and played a role of distributing already cut meats to the general public in restaurants and was an important aspect of diet. However, bones left over from butchered animals can often tell much more than just what the people were eating. Bones can tell us a lot about the people who ate them through different butchery techniques, cuts of meat and choice, as well as the context they were found in, we can determine a lot about food choices of the past. The three biggest things that Bones can tell us about historical butchery in San Diego is economic status, cultural indicators, and individual stories to better paint a picture of the past. Economic status. Economic status can be inferred from the types of bones and cuts that were found in the archeological record. When excavating, if archaeologists repeatedly find bones to indicate higher quality cuts of, meat, cuts of meat or higher quantities of meat, it can be assumed that this person was of a high enough status to afford such cuts. So quantity and quality can speak bounds about the status of the people living where you excavate. In San Diego, we have a unique history and blend of cultural traits. In early butchery during the Spanish-Mexican period, the use of hatchet and cleave marks were a preferred style of butchery. However, as time went on, European saw cuts became much more prevalent and were considered to be the higher class cuts. Here in this diagram on the left, we can see an example of a cleave mark left on bone, as well as another cleave mark on some weathered cattle ribs on the bottom left. On the right, we can see examples of saw, saw cuts, most importantly, if you look very closely, you can see the striations in the bone, and that is indicative of a saw cut. And down in the middle, we can see a modern example of a, an electric saw cut, very clean and not as uh, thick of striations. Historical archaeology is all about recovering and telling the story of past peoples, from the exciting to the most mundane activities in life, with every artifact uncovered, we get to piece together details of their lives and breathe life back into the past. Bones are no exception and can help reconstruct one of the most important but often overlooked aspects of life, which is diet. From something as simple as small burnt bones, we are able to get a glimpse into the world of the past and tell the stories of the future. Juan Bandini, pictured here on the left, was an important figure of historical San Diego. In 1829, Juan constructed the Casa de Bandini, which was his house and store, eventually converting into a restaurant and hotel in 1869 when it was renamed the Cosmopolitan Hotel. This building is on San Diego's historical registrar and still stands as a restaurant and hotel in Old Town San Diego today. During a renovation of the building in 2008, the original kitchen was unearthed and excavations were undertaken. Uncovered during the excavations were the remains of earths and adobe ovens cooked directly on the floor, which can be seen in the figure on the left. This was indicative of the Spanish slash Mexican style of cooking prevalent in San Diego, which persisted even to the late historical times. Of the artifacts found, faunal material was found in abundance in trash pits dug into the floor. Photographed here are some of the animal bones found in this excavation, which included burned mammal, bird, and fish bones. As quoted from the field report on the excavation of room 105 of the Casa de Bandini, which was the old kitchen, mammal and bird remains included cow, sheep, slash goat, and chicken. Beef bones retained butchering scars that indicated various processing activities, including reduction of meat-bearing skeletal elements, meat removal, and marrow extraction. The bone assemblage reflects a clear reliance on cattle processed, with tools and butchering techniques indicative of traditional Hispanic butchering methods. According to faunal analyst Susan Arder, 
Of considerable significance is a small number of sawn bones processed according to Euro-American tradition. Butchering was done with hand axes and or cleavers and knives. Only a handful of specimens were hand sawn. Articulated fish skeletons suggested roasting gutted whole fish over coals and then removing the flesh. As shown from historical records and further evidence by the use of Mexican style of butchery and cooking techniques, Bandini's head of chef was Mexican. However, the story that these bones tell us does not stop there. Again, from historical records, we also know that he hired Native American women in his kitchen to work as kitchen aides. Including in the faunal material found during excavation was many small mammal remains, with clear evidence of butchery and cooking. However, these animals would not have been served in a restaurant setting. Instead, a different story emerges, once again backed up by historical evidence that his Native American kitchen helpers were catching and cooking their own lunch, consisting of small mammals such as rodents and rabbits, and disposed of the bones in the fires with the rest of the restaurant food. This is one of the many examples of the stories that Bones can tell in historical settings, showcasing a little-known story of historic San Diego life. In conclusion, butchered bones recovered from the historical period in San Diego can tell a surprising amount of information about the past lives people lived, including something as important as everyday meals. After going through four of the most commonly butchered animals and identifying bones that would be associated with certain cuts of meat, we then got to see marks left on bones that are indicative of butchery. From there, we got to see a glimpse into San Diego's history when it comes to butchery, learning some of the many things that bones can tell us about the past. Most importantly, economic status, cultural indicators, indications, and glimpses into the past lives, told through the stories of the food they ate. There are plenty more stories to be told and uncovered about historic butchery in San Diego, each one highlighting what this artifact type can tell us about the past and why it matters. I wanted to give a special thanks to Phil Unit, Aaron Sasson, and Susan Arter for permission and use of their collections at the San Diego Natural History Museum.